Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Site Management and Inspections. Uh, today we're going to be discussing safety, job site safety. So we're going to be giving you an overview of some of the things from a management perspective uh, that you have to pay attention to. This by no means is intended to replace like full course training in a particular topical area. This is part of our site management course. Uh, you need to receive specific training for job site safety to ensure that you're fully trained and competent on the work site. So, um, but we do plan to today, or at least I plan to today, uh, give you a good uh, overview of some of the things that you need to consider when it comes to um, managing on a job site, operating on a job site, working on a job site in construction. Um, so there are a lot of things to consider and construction historically uh, has not had exactly the best record when it comes to safety. Uh, it has made vast improvements over the last 10 to 15 years regarding um, the health and safety of workers on construction sites. Not that it didn't have safety requirements before that, but at least in the province of Ontario, there has been a lot of enforcement and a lot of uh, concern, as well as contractors have become more attuned to the necessity of operating a safe company and all the attributes, positive attributes that that brings to their business. Um, so I think collaboratively between governments uh, and uh, industry and workers, um, safety has improved drastically, but it still has a long ways to go, as, as you'll get a sense uh, when we talk about things in this lecture. Okay, so when we talk about uh, safety requirements and regulations in Ontario, we have what we call the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations for construction projects, very often referred to as the green book. Uh, you know, digitally things are changing, but obviously uh, historically we have this green book uh, that must be at every job site, it must be available. Uh, to um, be able to looked at by workers and interpreted. Um, today, things are very accessible, of course, uh, that we need to be able to access the act and regulations so that we ensure that we're operating safely in construction projects. Um, some of the uh, things that we think about as far as objectives, uh, and this is based on chapter eight of your textbook. And of course, chapter eight of your textbook is based on American safety act and regulation. So there are differences between the two. Um, the overarching principles though in that chapter are very applicable to what we're talking about. The specifics of regulations, as I said, you want to take a specific course on the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations and have specific training so that you can get approvals for specific things like um, fall arrest systems on a construction site, etc., so that you can actually go onto a construction site and work on a construction site. So uh, really, it, it's about building an awareness of uh, accident uh, prevention. That's one of the things we're trying to do today. Uh, various forms used in day-to-day -day administration of a safety program, some of the things that we have to consider. Uh, major areas found in the Code of Safe Practices, uh, WIMIS, uh, the aspects of making sure that information uh, is available uh, in the workplace with regards to um, uh, material safety and data sheets and uh, chemicals and uh, that people understand what uh, the um, safety requirements and storage requirements are of those particular chemicals to ensure their own personal safety and the safety of others. And basically, some of the things to think about with regards to um, how we can ensure that our projects are run more safely. So um, even on this little chart here, things, uh, and I got, I've got a bunch of little charts and pictures and stuff, so I'll probably bring things up as we go through the various slides just to hit home on some uh, key elements as we go through this uh, lecture. Uh, things like blind spots. When we're operating on a construction site, we have to be very careful. There's a lot of equipment on construction sites and we have to be very cognizant that there are blind spots. Just like when you're driving, you know, there's a blind spot. 
uh, well, there's a lot more blind spots in construction projects. And depending where you're operating, you might not see certain things. And so it's very possible that somebody could walk behind or in front of a piece of equipment. And because it's so high, you might not see them. Uh, so you also have to think that if you're an operator, you might not see them. But if you're actually walking yourself on a construction site, maybe somebody has called you on your cell phone and you're not paying attention. Uh, there are blind spots all over the place. So you have to be really, really careful about that. That's why it's not a good idea. And many uh, requirements are there for you not to be um, walking around and on your cell phone at the same time to make sure you're in a safe location when you're communicating um, that way, to make sure that your attention is on what you're doing because it only takes a split second for something to occur uh, on construction projects. So you have to be um, really have your, your sort of spidey sense, um, if you ever watch uh, Marvel Comics, um, uh, aware and attuned so that um, nothing happens. Uh, so when we think about uh, personal safety and management, there's the employer responsibility. First of all, everybody is responsible for safety on a construction site. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act requires that everyone do their due diligence. That's from the employee to the supervisor to the employer. And there are punishments for not doing that. Um, for an employer, it could be half a million dollars and it could even be criminal offense, which could mean jail time um, at the most severe level. Uh, for a manager, there can be uh, consequences to that. Uh, have to see if they've updated that, but it was $25,000 uh, fine to uh, management if um, you're not following the act, safety act and regulations. And then for the employee, if you're not following the act, there can be individual fines as well. Uh, so keep in mind of that. And uh, really, it's about being proactive and not reactive, uh, meaning that you're, you're trying to prevent accidents before they happen. You're trying to operate a safe site, uh, not being responsive after things um, occur and making sure that you're following the requirements uh, of um, the Ministry of Labor. It's really three tiers. You have the Ministry of, of Labor, uh, which really looks after um, the enforcement of the act and regulations. And then there's uh, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association of Ontario, which is really trying to educate the construction industry. And then we have WSIB, Workers Safety and Insurance Board, which protects workers after an accident happens or before an accident happens in the sense that they are insured. Uh, if they're injured on the job, that they would uh, be compensated while uh, they heal themselves, etc. Um, so you have sort of three levels. WSIB also is, is the one that collects the premiums from the contractors, your boss, uh, which means they have to pay that insurance to WSIB. It's in everybody's interest that you have very few accidents on a project. No accidents on a project would be ideal. And that means that there's lower premiums to pay because there's lower money that's being paid out to all the injured people uh, in uh, the construction industry. And Ministry of Labor is really, like I said, the enforcement. Uh, they kind of come on site and uh, they will give out the fines. They will close down sites that are operating unsafely. They will do um, inspections and they will do um, investigations to determine what caused a particular accident. So um, we really have those three operating entities in Ontario that help to protect workers on construction sites. So we have WSIB, Workers Safety and Insurance Board, MOL, Ministry of Labor. Usually they wear a blue hard hat when they come on site. And we have um, the um, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association. It used to be Construction Safety Association of Ontario. They're kind of amalgamated uh, now with different sections like mining, for example. So uh, when we think about the, uh, the uh, safety health programs and um, the um, Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, management needs to be committed from right from the top, right throughout. Uh, we really have to make sure that we are 
um, ensuring and identifying potential hazards on the site. So that's the proactive aspect. Planning safety. Safety is like anything else. You've got to plan for it. You've also got to make it easy. That requires planning. That means that you've got to make sure that you have all the correct safety equipment, signage, fencing, etc., on site so that it is readily available so somebody doesn't all of a sudden try to do something before they have the equipment. That is a problem. So that's the proactive side. Uh, making sure that all the workers that are on site are properly certified for the various things that they're doing. For example, if they're operating a swing stage, you have to make sure that they've been properly trained and certified to operate uh, a swing stage. If it's a specific piece of equipment, have they been certified to operate that piece of equipment? Uh, so these are all uh, things that need to be done and planned for and then have mechanisms, processes, systems in place to ensure that it is being enforced and that you are not in a position where somebody can get hurt. So there's corporate safety policies that must be done. And again, the Occupational Health and Safety Act has specific requirements around that. So I'm not going to get into too much specifics about that, but you have to understand that as a business, you have to have a corporate safety policy. And then it can't be something that just sits on a shelf collecting dust. It has to be something that is used on an ongoing uh, basis and that your employees know and understand the requirements within this. All right, so um, typical policy declaration, idea that safety is the highest priority. And it really comes down to, we've talked about the interaction between time, cost, quality, scope, and then we've had safety. And safety is something that we shouldn't be, uh, can't compromise uh, if we intend to be uh, in this uh, business for any length of time because it's who's going to want to work with you when you don't have basically the backs of your own employees protected, right? In today's environment, that's unacceptable behavior. And so companies that are successful today recognize the importance of that and take a high moral and ethical grounds on it beyond even what the regulations require, uh, which is outstanding from that perspective. So uh, when we think about um, say the, basically some of the actions, there's two ma major categories of accidents, unsafe actions by people and unsafe conditions left uncorrected. People sometimes don't know what's in their best interests. All right. Um, you could call it that the government takes sort of a paternal or maternal um, sort of view of workers by having the Safety Act and regulations. What I mean by that is people sometimes don't look after their own interest as well as they should. You know, it's, if you smoke, that you know that's not good for you, but that doesn't necessarily stop you from smoking. So it's kind of the same thing. Unfortunately, sometimes people do things uh, without thinking about it or thinking about the possible consequences of their actions and then that causes an accident. And sometimes it, cause, it could cause an accident to somebody else besides yourself. So that's a, another thing that um, can occur and go on. So um, unsafe actions by people, uh, a good example would be piecework. Uh, in construction, especially in low-rise residential, we do a lot of things by piecework. Uh, framers get paid by the square foot, how much you're framing. There's an incentive there to get more done because you get paid more. So maybe if you don't have a piece of safety equipment with you or it becomes damaged, you continue to work and then you get hurt. Well, you continue to work because you don't want to spend the time to go get another piece of safety equipment because maybe you're going to lose some money in that perspective. Meanwhile, you get hurt and you lose a whole pile of money and you're in pain and all these other things that are going on. Right. So that's one of the reasons backing up government regulations is to ensure that you as a worker um, look after your own interests. Then you also have employers who may be kind of put pressuring workers if they're not um, working uh, as fast as they want them to work or they're maybe not providing safe equipment. So when we look at safety in, a, in the, my uh, part B section of this week's uh, lectures, which is 8B, kind of use an example of um, the Empire State Building construction. Um, 
when you think about the Empire State Building, it was built at a time where safety regulations were quite different than they are now. Uh, so of course, it was actually considered a reasonably safe project for its time, uh, but still five people died building it. Probably a better example even would be the Hoover Dam where hundreds of people died building the Hoover Dam. And uh, at that time period, you know, the Hoover Dam was considered this, this huge success, this modern marvel. But if you took that into today's standards, you'd be looking at, well, how come management is not in jail or where we've got the lawyers working on this to put them in jail because there was so many accidents on this particular project. So there's two major categories of accidents, unsafe actions by people and unsafe conditions left uncorrected. So somebody takes down a railing or doesn't put up a railing and then somebody comes by and they fall off, right? It could be a construction worker, it could be somebody visiting the site, it could be a kid that's kind of crawled onto the site that wants to um, explore and there was no railing there and they fall, um, whatever. Uh, that's an unsafe condition left uncorrected. So we have um, regulations in place to ensure that um, workers don't uh, fall or if they do there's a limitation to um, the injury that they will cause themselves so that's why we have um, PPE personal protective equipment and we have fall arrest systems that workers have to wear um, if you're working on roofs if you have a, an opportunity to fall more than eight feet you have to have a personal protective piece of equipment and um, that sort of thing. So you have to uh, know how to use the equipment properly. You have to know how to check the equipment to make sure that it's not become damaged over time, that it's still safe to operate. So there's all these, these components that, um, and areas of work that you need to understand and safety practices that um, require extra training in those areas. Uh, accident prevention, again, some of the things too, companies can help themselves. Uh, with improving themselves. I think I have a link for an example of a toolbox talk here. Um, let me see, I haven't checked this. Uh, da -da. Yeah, okay, we're good. Um, so this is a toolbox talk example. I'm trying to remember, this might have been from a West, this particular um, example, uh, but a sample toolbox talk. Um, so they had these um, sample toolbox uh, talks. I think I've got the... Uh, yeah, Saskatchewan, I thought it was from out west. Uh, so they've sort of standardized a number of their toolbox talks and you can have topics. So you have a specific topic that you're, if you're getting into guardrails in, the, in your um, job site, you know, maybe now you're out of the ground and you need some uh, guardrails in particular areas, you have a toolbox talk. So that's usually something that you could just do, you know, outside uh, by the tailgate of your truck and you could go through things that you're concerned about that are coming up on your job site and you could uh, discuss those particular areas with your workers and your team and you're reinforcing the Construction Act. You're making sure that everybody understands uh, what are the concerns. Uh, people have inputs. Uh, where people closest to the work have a, probably the most excellent ideas of how to ensure the site is safe. And that's also putting into the top of everybody's minds the importance of um, construction safety. So tailgate or toolbox safety meetings, it's a really good practice to reinforce um, the safety act and regulations and to sh demonstrate that you are doing your, your due diligence and trying your best to make sure that everybody is operating safely on your projects and sites. Um, and of course, um, whatever that may be, whether it's um, um, noise protection, uh, whether it's um, dust uh, protection or um, basically vapor protection, depending on what you are working with, those all become um, important discussions. I think with everybody wearing masks today, I think if nothing else positive comes out of this, uh, I think people are more used to wearing masks. So you'll probably see people that very often uh, should have been wearing masks, um, now wearing them. Uh, medical, got to look for the positives, right? <laughs> uh, medical and first aid facilities and services. Uh, so also making sure that you have first aid on site, uh, that you report any accidents. I think I've got that in another slide as well. 
uh, and um, that people have been trained uh, for first aid. Uh, Red Cross has all kinds of um, training. Uh, so does the Infrastructure Health and Safety Association, all kinds, because they're on the preventative side. They're making sure that people are um, trained. And if anything happens, well, they're right on site. And so that the proper equipment is readily available and everybody knows where it is. Uh, protection of the general public. And so we just mentioned guardrails with that toolbox talk. You gotta make sure they're in place. And if for some reason something has to be taken down for uh, some work to proceed, you've gotta make sure that it's put right back up and that the people working around it aren't in a position to fall. Uh, and that holes aren't left open, that somebody walks and falls in a hole, like a stairwell opening, common one, right? Um, so uh, overhead protection from falling objects, uh, traffic controls, security surveillance of the site, walkway protection. That's, you'll see like where you've got sidewalks and protection over the sidewalks when they're typically doing condominium buildings would be a good example. Like on Young Street, you see that all the time. Um, yeah, so uh, these are all examples. Uh, fire protection and electrical protection. So electricity, it's very easy to get electrocuted on a project. Um, when I was uh, around 19 and I was working in construction, uh, there was uh, somebody, and this, this sort of resonates with me every time I see it. Uh, so you're looking at the voltage on the hydro lines. So depending on the hydro lines on the street, uh, the hydro line coming to the house has lower voltage. Um, but uh, the hydro lines on the street, they can have quite a significant voltage. And if you are close to it, you don't have to touch a high voltage wire. If you're close to it and you are the easiest path to ground for essentially um, the um, current to flow, if it flows, if you're the easiest path to ground, it's going to arc, it's going to jump and then it'll go through you. So an example of this happened when I was 19. A uh, worker was, and it was a young guy, he was 18, I was 19 at the time. He was working for, on another project right beside the project we were working on. And he was working for a roofing company and he had an extension ladder fully extended. It was a 40 foot extension ladder and he was, it was a damp, drizzly day. So it was a damp, drizzly day. And he had the ladder didn't touch it because I saw it, didn't touch it. I saw the arc come to the ladder. That made his muscles tighten up because that's typically what happens. So now he's gripped onto the ladder. The ladder fell against the hydro line. It actually cut into this aluminum ladder. It actually cut into the aluminum ladder and then he passed away. It electrocuted him, um, you know. So that is a memory that I will never forget. And you have to be cognizant of all these little things. Up to that point, I'm 19, I think, you gotta touch the hydro lines for it to be a problem. No, you don't have to touch the hydro lines for it to be a problem. It depends on the voltage. It also depends on the condition. Damp, drizzly day, guess what? You're a better path to ground. The ladder's wet, your hands are wet, your boots are wet. Uh, so that becomes um, a problem that way. Uh, so electricity is a problem. Don't think that working with cords that have are frayed and um, falling apart or have the ground missing um, are going to protect you. That's a problem. Those are um, not um, good uh, ways of getting, you're, you're gonna get uh, shocked very easily. Uh, you need to make sure that your tools are plugged into a GFI, a ground fault circuit interrupter. A GFI is those little ones you see with a button in the bathroom and you might wonder what does that do? Well, it protects people. A ground fault circuit interrupter protects people. It measures the current or the amperage that's going out and the current or amperage that's coming back. And if it's different in milliamps, it kicks off the circuit breaker. So the measurement of current going out and the measurement of current going back, it trips it and that protects people. Um, because it's milliamps, you don't get electrocuted in that time. But at the same time, don't trust it because it's mechanical, maybe it doesn't work. That's why it's got a test button. You've got to uh, test them uh, periodically to make sure that they're actually um, working and that it trips it. 
So you have to be cognizant of that. That so any any work that you're doing like outdoors and that sort of thing, you must make sure it's plugged into a GFI. Um, that that will help to protect you for those types of things. But again, it doesn't protect you for everything. And so I I would emphasize: don't think, oh, I'm plugged in. Look at me. Look what I can do. No. Uh, but make sure you are plugged into a GFI, nevertheless. I remember when I was, um, again, uh, working in construction, it was a similar kind of thing to this uh, example, except I had a circular saw. We call it circular saw or skill saw is really the company name that originally invented it. Uh, basically, I had a circular saw and I was working in construction and um, we were working in an old house and it was wood lath and plaster and it was knob and tube wiring. Knob and tube wiring is very old and it was kind of frayed and it had knob and tube wiring. There was lots of bare spots in the wiring. We we're gutting this house and there was a pile of um, rubble and I had this aluminum ladder, step ladder. Aluminum step ladder is not great because uh, the current travels through it. Better fiberglass. Uh, but aluminum ladder and um, I moved it in the rubble and it hit a bare spot on the knob and tube um, wiring and I had the skill saw in the other hand and back then these old skill saws they didn't have uh, plastic handles they had metal handles so see how that's plastic now so they had metal handles and the metal the casing was grounded but the casing was actually grounded to protect you in case there was a short inside the motor but it didn't understand it didn't recognize that if I have current coming through this arm going through me going to a grounded circular saw I'm the easy path to ground so when my ladder touched that uh, wire I was a perfect path to ground and so I remember like it was yesterday I'm kind of going, uh, it's kind of like out of a cartoon, uh, and it's like it seemed like it was forever because my muscles cramped up on the ladder. The only thing that really saved me was because I was able to push the ladder off the wire, right? Um, so you have to be very cognizant of these things. And you know what? In all honesty, back when I was a kid working in construction, things weren't the way they are now. They weren't as, uh, there wasn't the same kind of emphasis that there is today on safety. So whatever the regulations are for safety today, don't dismiss them. Don't think that they're too high. They're not. 10 years from now, they'll be better than they are today. It's just the evolution of things and there will be fewer deaths and fewer accidents on construction projects as we evolve and as we get better at these things and protect yourself. Protect yourself with masks if it's a dusty uh, environment. Protect yourself with the proper equipment. People don't know the long-term effects. We talk about asbestos and it was this you know, horrible material and uh, all the problems it causes. We don't know what material we're, we're working with now in construction that in five, 10 years, they'll be saying this is not good, right? Uh, and this is the reason because it takes time for it to show up in people's systems. So if it's a dusty environment, I would be making sure that you're wearing the proper um, breathing apparatus to ensure that you're protected that way. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, so yeah, so the GFI, ground fault circuit interrupter, uh, making sure that you're plugged in, it does protect um, for these types of things. Um, when I used to sh teach shop classes um, years ago, I remember there was a student and we were working outside cut the actual um, cord, it dropped right into the puddle uh, and he was standing in the puddle, but it was a non-issue, it flipped the GFI. Like, so it was nicked the cord, flipped the GFI, so that was okay in that case. Um, but don't put your money on the GFI protecting you, but you make sure that you're plugged into a GFI. So you'll reap those um, positive benefits. Um, on our construction sites too, you know what? Today, there's a lot of people that have addictions, uh, they have mental health issues, they have other uh, problems. Like, you know, today, practically everybody has some sort of uh, mental health issues. We, we live in a world where there's a lot of things going on, a lot of different 
uh, anxieties and uh, it's a fairly normal thing. We have to be as companies, uh, we have to be empathetic to this and we have to, and if we want to be successful because it's just a, a systemic issue in today's society, we have to make sure that we uh, protect those workers in a number of ways. Um, and as far as uh, abusive behavior to others, which can cause all kinds of other kinds of issues. Uh, as a company, we have to sort of stand behind our workers and ensure that protections are in place. And there's all kinds of government regulatory requirements behind that to help ensure that those protections are in place. But we also have to make sure that um, people are not coming on our projects and are not aware of what their, you know, their intoxic, their, their alcohol levels are, etc., and that they could cause an accident that could injure somebody else, not just themselves. Um, so we have to sort of think about things in proactive ways too. I remember, uh, and I may have mentioned this before, but I remember when I was doing work, uh, some work with Madame e. Holmes uh, years back, they were very proactive on things and it was um, World Cup soccer. And a lot of their, a lot of their uh, employees, of course, they were into the World Cup soccer. And so they were losing a lot of time and a lot of the, uh, not their employers, but subcontractors would go maybe to um, a bar and watch a game and have a few drinks and then come back. Well, they didn't want that to happen. And, then, and they knew that they would want to leave to watch the game. And they knew that was pretty important to uh, the subcontractors. So they actually set up big tents with big screen TVs, uh, had uh, free non-alcoholic -alco beverages, non-alcoholic, and that way they could watch their game, get all excited, and then they could go back to work. Um, so uh, sometimes you've got to think things through uh, so that you actually are proactive. And if you see a potential uh, situation that could be problematic, um, you act on it in a proactive way. And so that would be a good example of a company doing that. So PPE, I already mentioned, but hard hats, you have to mention, you have to make sure that they're the pro proper classification. They have a CSA symbol. Uh, they are also, uh, there's time links on how good for how long a hard hat is. There's usually in the front brim of the hat, there's usually a, an indentation of the, the date um, uh, that uh, the hard hat was manufactured. And then it has so long that it is um, usable for because things get brittle over time, etc. cetera. Uh, we also have um, the basically the, the triangle, the green triangle or stamp that may be um, indicated on our safety shoes. And this omega symbol is um, indicating its protection against its fire, uh, sorry, its electrical protection, um, current protection for the safety boots. So we have to have a safety toe uh, in the, the safety shoe to protect against something falling on your foot. And then it has to have uh, basically protection inside the boot so that you don't step on a nail and it goes right through the boot uh, too easily. Don't get the bright idea that it offers too much protection by jumping on something. Uh, that would not be a good idea. Uh, but um, safety boots are designed to um, protect you um, when you're on a construction site as are hard hats within reason, right? Um, and of course, all the other things that like we talked about noise protection and um, hearing protection and hearing protection is a big deal. Uh, there's so much noisy equipment that you want to make sure that you're protecting your hearing. Uh, there's no point in becoming uh, my age and then not being able to hear when you could have if you had worn proper uh, hearing protection. Uh, so keep uh, those things in mind. Respiratory protection, particularly. See, one of the things with construction, as I was mentioning, you don't feel it when you breathe in the dust maybe a couple of days, but long term, the impacts can be much more substantial. So um, don't think that it's not, it's a non-issue. It builds in your system over time. That's some of the issues we have getting people to buy into the safety things. So they don't notice it, the little things, but they build up over time. Hazardous materials communication. So we do have this MSDS programs and WIMIS programs and making sure these are a separate training program. So again, I'm not going to get into the nuances and details here. Uh, but all employees need to be trained on that. And it's making sure that you're storing, you're labeling, you're educating people on the chemicals uh, and um, hazardous uh, 
uh, materials that you have on your site so that somebody doesn't use something inappropriately. Communicating safety on, on the site too. Uh, you, like you'll see on the front entrance, there'll be you know how to, where the nearest hospital is, what the quickest path is, um, that kind of information, uh, all kinds of uh, information with regards to um, uh, communications on project sites. This one's actually just a, this photo with the identification of nails coming up from a two by four. This is from one of the um, IFHA, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association uh, sites, but I've got some uh, photos in the next lecture or at the end of this one where I just walked a site this morning and took some photos, like same thing. Like, I don't know why you would do that, leave that that way. I can tell you, and I've told you how much it's improved construction sites. And then I see this uh, kind of situation this morning. And I can tell you even 30 years ago, we wouldn't let this happen on our sites. Like with the nail, that's just an accident waiting to happen. And of course, uh, safety communications continues like on the site. And I sort of had this one earlier with blind spots and um, signaling for direction. It could be for cranes, it could be for traffic. And as in this case, uh, and the proper hand signals and making sure you got a signal person for people so that the blind spots don't become an issue. You've got an extra set of eyes on it to make sure that things are operating safety. So this is actually from the Occupational Health and Safety Act requirements and sort of just giving some overviews of what the requirements are on a project. So for example, appoint a supervisor if five or more workers are on the project at the same time, ensure the project is supervised at all time. A project that lasts more than three months has 20 or more workers must have a joint health and safety committee. Uh, if the JHSC is not, rec uh, not required and there are more than five workers, the workers must select a health and safety representative. Again, you can make a career out of being a health and safety rep uh, with larger uh, companies. Complete a Ministry of Labor, and we talked about Ministry of Labor, MOL, um, registration form, so it's a registered project, and that means they know of it, they can visit it at different times, uh, and that's a requirement. Uh, keep a copy of all employer approved registration forms on site, send a notification of project uh, to the Ministry of Labor, as I mentioned, develop written emergency procedures, uh, ensure ready access to a telephone, two-way radio or other system in the event of an emergency, Re report a fatality, critical injury or other prescribed incidents such as critical injury to the Ministry of Labor. Uh, when somebody gets uh, into an accident on a site, first thing they ask you at the hospital, um, how did this happen? And if you say it was work related, they note that. Uh, part of the way the hospitals are funded, the money comes through WSIB if it's a work related injury. So that information is going to go to WSIB. But if as a company and as a manager, you didn't report it, they're going to find out about it later and then they're going to come to investigate and there's going to be big, big problems because you were not clear and transparent because they may have wanted to come to the site and investigate whether the site was uh, not in accordance with the act and regulations. And now it's later, um, so it, they can't investigate. Um, from their point of view, it's almost like you were in the scene of an accident and intoxicated and you left the scene of an accident. From that's the kind of perspective they have on that kind of situation. Um, so supervisors must ensure that workers use the methods, procedures by the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations for construction project. That's the green book I mentioned earlier. Super, uh, use or wear the equipment or clothing that the employer requires and that is required under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Supervisors must also tell workers about actual or potential dangers, give workers written instructions when required, take every precaution reasonable. That's the due diligence aspect. The do, you did everything you could to try to make your project safe, right? The worker. Tell your supervisor and employer about the equipment problems or other hazard. You you should, you know, it's the, <laughs> what, what's the saying now? If you see something, say something. So this is really the same idea. If you see something, you say something. Um, you have an obligation, a responsibility to do that. That's you doing your due diligence. 
You have the right to refuse work, big one. The right to refuse, the right to refusal that you believe endangers your health or safety, right? That is very important. So if you feel that you are being put in harm's way, that your employer is putting you in a situation that contravenes the act and regulations, you can say, I refuse to do this. Um, so uh, that, you know, people get worried about that because your employer could fire you. And you know what? I suppose they could, not then, because that would be a problem. They can't. Um, but that doesn't mean they couldn't come up with dream up some other excuse a few days later of something else, right? People always get concerned about those things. But I, would, I just want to pose it to you this way. Do you really want to work for somebody that's going to put you in harm's way that way? I'm going to say I don't. Um, so uh, if that's the kind of company you're working for, I'm going to say, you know what? Let them try. And in the meantime, I'm probably looking for another job anyways. Um, so I wouldn't be doing something that contravenes the act and regulations and you feel that puts you in a compromised position. It's your life. You've got a long career. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to protect your family. So uh, follow your employer's instructions. As if they're telling you what to do with here and you're, you, should, you need to follow them, if they're following the act and regulations or if they're going above and beyond the act and regulations, you should be following their instructions, right? Uh, they're trying to make you safe in that case. It's different if they're trying to make you not safe by contravening the act or putting you in an unsafe condition, right? Uh, never engage in horse place. On some, that becomes a problem sometimes, right? People start playing around and then somebody gets hurt. So you have to be cognizant of that. You have to create, you have to be part of creating the culture of safety on your projects. And you can lead that. Uh, and that's the way you should be acting to try to lead that. And the company will be better as a result of that. And the, everybody within the company should be doing that. So if senior management takes that seriously, um, it filters all the way through the organization. Uh, so questions that need to be, you know, who employ, who employs the injured? Was there a death? Uh, was the casework related? Was the case or injury? Was the case an injury or an illness? Was the injury recordable? There's all these requirements again under the act. And if some, you know, like WSIB has a lot of requirements to that the employer is to help that worker get back to work. If they have to put them into a different position because they can no longer do that particular job, there's a lot of pressure from the WSIB to do that. So if you're in a bigger company and you became injured, there's usually that bigger company has a lot of different positions. So there's a lot of pressure for that company to retrain you for another position. Maybe it's an office position. Maybe it's going from site work to estimating, etc. cetera. Uh, if it's a small company, that becomes a little bit more problematic. But again, there is a lot of uh, requirements there. So the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, protects workers, as I said, um, establishes the procedures for dealing with the hazards and um, ensuring that um, the project and the workers are safe, right? So it's being very proactive uh, as a result. And historically, as I mentioned, construction has not had that great a record. You, you know what, just Google Hoover Dam construction and look at the images, the photos, Google uh, the um, uh, Empire State Building photos, look at the image, like construction images, and see how workers worked back then. And you could even see, you could even go with the World Trade Center uh, images and that kind of thing. You can see how people worked and it was like very precarious compared to today. And there are we still have a way to go, as, as I said, but um, we are moving in the right direction. The only place I would say, you know, where you don't have the Occupational Health and Safety Act is homeowners, right? Like if you're doing your own thing in your own residence, uh, Ministry of Labor is not going to come on site and say, where's your hard hat? Um, that's typically what's the way that's going to work. But if if it's a construction site, that's a different story. So if you're building your backyard deck, you probably are not going to get uh, Ministry of Labor on you. Um, but uh, 
if you're employing somebody to build your backyard deck uh, and you're working with them, well, that's different. So uh, employee's responsibility, as, as I kind of went through already, all of these areas, and again, you know, having the proper PPE, personal protective equipment as required, and that it's actually been um, safe. All right. And as I mentioned, right to refuse. And then number two is right to participate in the Workplace Health and Safety Act's Joint Health and Safety Committee. Right to know or the right to be informed about actual and potential dangers in the workplace. So that, that means you don't hire somebody new. They don't really know what's going on and you don't bother to tell them. They're not been properly trained. They've not been made aware of possible um, uh, potential dangers on the project. And as we mentioned, comply with the regulations. So these regulations are really important from that perspective. And um, making sure, as we said, the corporate plan, safety program and policy. And it's not just something you're giving lip service to. Supervisors, again, so I'm just reinforcing this, Employ complies with the act and regulation, ensures that equipment, protective devices, clothing required is used and worn, takes every precaution, so due diligence. I've got a bunch of links to YouTube uh, videos here, and so I'll be posting the slides, um, or you can just copy them out of um, the video, pause it, and you can check them out. Uh, but um, you'll see that there, there are some, they give you a good sense of safety requirements in the construction industry. And this is Infrastructure Health and Safety Association. Uh, they're all uh, pretty much, uh, I think one might be from BC, but most of them are provincial um, videos from Ontario. Uh, so you'll see that it just sort of gives you an overview and a good sense, and then you can follow the links and see a lot more um, requirements, right? So, uh, very, very uh, taken seriously as far as enforcement and uh, making sure that they are, that as an employer, you are enforcing your safety program and that you are at minimum following the Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations. So, I have one more sort of little topic here that I, I just kind of put in too. So it's not in the textbook, this part, but it is very important, uh, is the aspect of checklists. And I probably mentioned this in one of my earlier lectures because it comes up over and over again. It comes up in safety, it comes up in site management, it comes up in site logistics. It's a big deal. So uh, checklists can be very, very helpful. In fact, I did a checklist just before I shot this video and I caught a couple of things. <laughs> one of the things on my checklist is uh, I've been converting my slides and changing things around for these videos so that I can make it work. And it, it actually seems to take forever. And one of my uh, checklists uh, was, on one of my items was to make sure that the slide format is for widescreen instead of the old uh, rectangular screen because everybody's watching on their iPads and everything like that. Uh, the narrow screen works fine on, on a laptop, but um, so... Uh, I saw that and then I looked at my slides and I realized, no, it's not on the widescreen. So I had to check the widescreen. That means you got to reformat probably every slide and you got to update everything and re redo it. But it's nice to have the checklist because a lot of times instead I start the video, I do the video and then afterwards I look and it's like, oh, it's not widescreen. That's not too good. So that helps me not miss those types of things. I've got about 12 things when I do a video that I, I check now. It's building on things, but I clean the clean the the camera I've done that and I shot a video and then it's all foggy everything because I guess I had my fingerprints over the camera uh, and then that's frustrating uh, so checklists can be very very helpful and uh, the checklist manifesto is one of the best books I've read that sort of gave me ideas for things with regards to checklist and it's written by a doctor Atal Gawande and he was a surgeon and he came up with this notion that why don't we have checklists when we do surgery 
And he found that there was like just as many accidents in surgery as there was 50 years ago. That'd be like saying there's just as much accidents in construction safety as 50 years ago. There's not, there's a lot less, right? Um, at least per, per capita. Uh, and so he went outside the hospital one day and he saw an addition going on the hospital and he asked, well, what's going on? He went into the construction trailer and he saw the schedule on the wall saw the site uh, he saw the the submittals log and he asked the project manager you know what is all this and he, they said well it's just essentially checklists for us and inspection uh listings so the checklist to make sure all the inspections are done so we have a lot of checks and balances in the system to make sure we don't miss something really important it's why you don't see so many major uh bridge collapses when it's uh, you see a bridge collapse like the one in florida the one in italy uh, uh, a couple of years ago, um, it was a big do, a big deal. It's big news, and so checklists help to ensure that you don't miss those types of a, might those types of things during the construction process. So safety is the perfect place to have and develop a series of checklists that when you're doing management by wandering around, M B W A or a Gemba walk, walking around for quality control, quality insurance. You're also looking for safety and you're making sure that the project is done in a safe um, way. So you, any of you that are interested, if you look up Atal Gawande, there's lots of interviews, etc. When they impl implemented the checklist program with the World Health Organization and hundreds of house hospitals around the world, there was a 50% drop in the fatalities due to errors in hospitals, 50% by developing checklists. So just think of that. And they carefully monitored it and researched it. Uh, think of what that can do. So here's a sample um, checklist for protective equipment, just as, a, as a, an idea going out there, but you could have it for a multitude of things depending on what your project is. And depending on the specific safety conditions that you know that you're going to need to watch and monitor very carefully. So in summary, I hope that this has just given you a little bit of realization with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Green Book, uh, making sure that you um, uh, take that um, to heart. If you're doing individual training on safety, don't think it's a bird course. Take it very seriously. Take it very seriously. Uh, and just to, just to finish up, uh, you know, I mentioned blind spots and things of that nature. Again, when I was um, 19 years old, um, I was at a, a dump and a person stopped me and said, you better stop unloading the truck. And I said, why? And he said, there's a person dead beside you and basically a big truck backed over them, right? Blind spot. They didn't see that person that walk behind the truck, big 40 yard disposal box, uh, and the wheels went over that person, right? So safety, it just happens, like uh, accidents happen in, in, a, in a blink of an eye. And until you've seen it, and I hope you never do, uh, then um, you just, you underestimate it. And so don't underestimate it. I don't underestimate it. I can tell you that, right? Um, so please take it very seriously and not to be a downer or anything with that sort of closing i just want it to resonate with you and uh, if it if it resonates a bit and it somehow um, prevents you from uh, seeing or being involved in any of those situations then i think i'll be uh, happy um, so have a wonderful day and we'll see you in the next video tom stevenson signing off for now